dear colleagues, it's a great pleasure for me to discuss with you the role of diffusing capacity for carbon monoxide in the post-COVID area. My name is Helgo Magnussen. I'm the former medical director of the Center of Pneumology and Thoracic Surgery in Gosansdorf. Gosansdorf is close to Hamburg in, in Germany. And I was the founder of the Pulmonary Research Institute, both the Lung Clinic at Gosansdorf, the present name, and the Pulmonary Research Institute are both members of the Center for Lung Research. First of all, I would apologize that my voice is not totally okay, but I hope that if I speak slowly, you can hear me correctly. My conflicts of interest are more or less none because I'm the advisory in the advisory board of NDD. In the next slide, I would like to start with some few numbers. The worldwide number of SARS-CoV-2 infections is about 160 million infections, 19 active cases, and about 3 million deaths. These are reasonable, these are very, very, no, something is going wrong now. Okay. Next one. Okay, let's start with a very important publication from Nalbandian and co-workers. You see a lot of co-workers, which has published in Nature Medicine, the post-acute COVID-19 syndrome. Next slide. In this very informative picture, you can see more or less all of what you should know about COVID. First of all, the disease, of course, starts with SARS-CoV-2 exposure. This is about two weeks before symptoms may start. And you have a PCR positive reaction from the nasopharyngeal part of the body and viral isolation from the respiratory tract. And then about two to three weeks later, the symptoms will occur. And these symptoms are not only in the lung, the symptoms are in many organs of the body and they generate a number of um, symptoms. For example, fatigue, decline in quality of life, muscular weakness, joint pain, and dyspnea, cough, and persistent oxygen requirement as well as anxiety, cognitive disturbances, headaches, palpitation, chest pain, thromboembolism, chronic breast, uh, kidney disease, and hair loss. In the next slide, these uh, symptoms and the um, organs involved in the disease process are given here in percent of all together, of all symptoms together. And you see in the uh, green bar that lung diseases and respiratory symptoms are the prominent feature of uh, the post lung, uh, post COVID syndrome. Next slide. Early in the beginning of uh, the huge number of uh, post COVID publication, Mo from China published the abnormal pulmonary function in COVID-19 patients at time of hospital discharge. Next slide. Here you see a very busy table. I will not go in detail in this busy table, but I would explain to you the most important um, figures. The authors investigated patients with mild pneumonia and severe pneumonia, as well as very mild illness. And in the next slide, you will see 
the effect on spirometry in patients with mild pneumonia, pneumonia, and severe pneumonia. And you can see that forced vital capacity percent predicted, FEV1 in percent predicted, in FEV1 divided by FRC in percent predicted does not change any more with the cause and the severity of the disease. That is to say, we do not see any restrictive pattern or obstructive pattern. In the next slide, you will see the data on diffusion capacity in these patients with mild pneumonia, pneumonia and severe pneumonia. And here you can see that the diffusion capacity in percent predicted for carbon monoxide will decrease in a statistically significant manner with the severity of the pneumonia from 84.7% to 65.8. And the same is more or less true if you divide the diffusion capacity by the alveolar volume, the so-called Croak factor. And in the next slide, you will see the total lung volumes and see total lung capacity percent predicted decreases and residual volume decreases but the ratio of the residual volume to total lung capacity does not change. This shows that that the most important functional impairments is the decrease of diffusion capacity and not restriction and no obstruction. Next slide. Some months later, Thomas summarized all the data published so far on the change of diffusion capacity in relationship to the severity of the disease. And then the right hand, uh, in the left hand part of the upper of this figure, you will see mild COVID patients and the abnormal DLCO in percent. And four authors demonstrated that this is about 20%. In patients with moderate COVID, this number is much higher. It's about 40% and demonstrated by the investigations of six publications from six research groups. And the next uh, in the next part of the figure, no, please go back. In the left part of the, the lower part, sorry for this, you will see the data on the severe COVID-19. And again, we have six publications. And here you will see clearly that the decrease in DLCO is very, very predominant. And if we compare it directly on the right hand side of the lower part of the figure, then you will see the decrease of impairment of DLCO with a decrease of pneumonia. Next slide. The question is why DLCO impairs? Next slide. This is a very common, well known um, cartoon demonstrating the pathway of oxygen to come into the blood and will bind to the hemoglobin. And you know, in particular, we are interested in the transport of oxygen, but this is very difficult to measure. Therefore, we are using carbon monoxide. But the resistance the gas has to overcome is demonstrated in this figure very nicely. Next slide. CO's affinity to hemoglobin is approximately 230 times greater than that of oxygen. CO partial pressure in blood is negligible, allowing a quick transfer to hemoglobin. And 80% of the persistence of the resistance of carbon monoxide 
lies in the red blood cell component. The lung diffusion capacity has been described as the window to pulmonary microcirculation. And this wonderful term has been created by Michael Hughes and Pride, both very important and very interesting researcher in the field. Next slide. This paper was very interesting for me because it demonstrated that imaging methods are now available to show the small pulmonary blood vessels in patients with COVID-19. And here you see this visible representation of the blood vessels colored according to the size. The red denotes showing the small vessels, the yellow mid-sized vessels, and blue the larger vessels. COVID-19 patients display striking anatomies in the distribution of blood volume within the pulmonary vascular tree consistent with increased pulmonary vasculature resistance in the pulmonary vessels below the resolution of CT. And this wonderful technique is now available to study which vessels are affected in patients with COVID-19. And here you see, these are predominantly the small vessels. Next slide. But we have also other um, informations about the change of the vasculature in patients with COVID-19. Here the famous paper from Germany, published by the first author of Ackermann in the New England Journal of Medicine. And these informations have been gained by patients who died due to COVID-19. And the authors showed that severe endothelial injury and disruptive endothelial cell membranes can be identified. And they showed a widespread vascular thrombosis with microangiopathy and occlusion of the velar capillaries and significant new vessel growth. These are the highlights from the pathological point of view. Next slide. But we do not need only the pathology because pathology is a little bit too late. During the course of the disease, we have problems, uh, possibilities uh, to use recently developed imaging techniques that are, that are available to visualize the complicated processes. On the left hand side, you see computed tomography and pulmonary angiography in the middle. And on the right hand side, the result of dual energy CT perfusion in one person. And you see that on the left hand side, the soft tissue reconstruction showing filling defects in lower lobe of the pulmonary arteries. This is indicated by the thick errors. In the middle part, the maximum intensity projection of CT images showing vascular tree and butt pattern, which are well known for all radiologists. On the right hand side, in the corresponding dual energy CT, perfuse blood volume color map showing widespread perfusion defects. And altogether, you can use this techniques in one subject and then you understand immediately how predominant the effect of the pulmonary vascular is in patients with COVID-19. Next slide. In summary, given by the authors Patel and co-worker, physiological, hematological, and imaging data show severe COVID-19 pneumonia 
markedly impaired pulmonary perfusion, likely caused by pulmonary angiopathy and thrombosis. Next slide. Now, you now learned, or you know it already, that we have a huge number of patients, and these huge number of patients do not die, all of them. The majority of them survive. And therefore, it is so important to think about the care after the acute phase of COVID-19. And therefore, we need guidance on rehabilitation in the hospital and in the post-hospital phase. And there's a lot of activity, for example, by the Human Respiratory Society and the American Touristic Society. And Martin Sprout from Holland, Netherlands, has summarized what these two societies think about the rehabilitation. And the summary, next slide, is we need a multinational task force which recommends early, early bedside rehabilitation for patients affected by severe COVID-19. And the model of pulmonary rehabilitation may suit as a framework, particularly in a subset of patients with long-term respiratory consequences. There are some debates about the time where you should begin with the rehabilitation. But from my experience, it is important to start as early as possible and not wait for weeks or even months to start with rehabilitation. Next slide. But as I said, these activities are worldwide. And here you see published in chest a few weeks ago, a clinical blueprint for post-coronavirus disease recovery learning from the past, looking to the future. And these authors, they described their way to help a patient in the post-COVID time. Next slide. Now, is it really necessary to perform pulmonary rehabilitation in these patients? And here's one paper who, who measured lung function at the start of rehabilitation and the end of rehabilitation. And you see that there is a small change in FRC and a small change in FEV1. But at the bottom of the slide, as you see, the change in DLCO is the most important one, which is highly significant. And it shows that, that we need information about diffusion capacity during the disease and after the disease to understand why, in particular, the respiratory symptoms may persist. Next slide. But we have a problem with the COVID-19 pandemic. We are not allowed to perform lung function measurements and therefore we do not know what are the lung function before or at the beginning of the disease and therefore we have a lot of problems to understand what a number of diffusion capacity after two months means let us take patients with emphysema Patients with emphysema, emphysema normally have a decreased diffusion capacity for carbon monoxide. Do these diffusion capacity for carbon monoxide in patients with COPD will further decrease with COVID-19 or not? And therefore, it is necessary to do all to be able to measure lung function in the early part of the disease. Next slide, please. And therefore, these authors from this important paper, they claimed in most situations, spirometry 
with and without diffusion capacity should be helpful. But what is the time cost? Next slide, please. Let us make a summary. COVID-19 is associated with pulmonary vascular involvement. And DLCO is the most relevant pulmonary function test related to the severity of the disease. Next slide. DLCO should be assessed during the time course of the disease. And DLCO is helpful to initiate and to follow up post-COVID rehabilitation. Now, next slide. We are coming to the next slide. Probably you have understood that pulmonary vasculitis and coagulopathy may start during the infective phase of the disease. Are we allowed to measure this during this phase of the disease to measure at this time the LCO? From my understanding, but we have no data on this, this may help to predict severity of COVID-19 because it will, way more, it may well be that the pulmonary vasculitis will start also in the early part of the disease. Now we have decentralized testing under optimal hygiene conceptions. These conceptions and the machines for doing the LCO measurement and spirometry are available. And I hope that the number of lab laboratories and clinics and with all physicians who treat these patients, these machines and these lung function equipment will be available in the near future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Magnussen, for that presentation. That was very interesting. We do now have some time for questions. And I kindly ask the participants if they do have questions, please type them into the chat window. I will read them and Professor Magnussen will answer those. Yeah, again, uh, sorry for my voice. It is uh, very hard to speak for 30 minutes, <laughs> but I'm pleased to, uh, to try to answer your questions. Okay. No one has a question. This is yes. impossible. <laughs> <laughs> no question yet. <laughs> okay, I think now we have one. Then I have a question to you, to the audience. Do you believe that it makes sense to sample lung function data as early as possible? Because probably we then have a better way to predict the cause of the disease. Please say yes or no. <laughs> okay. That's a good question. And I think everybody can answer that for himself or herself. And I do have many questions coming in now here for you, Professor Magnussen. And I would say I start with the first one. How do we prevent the transmission on COVID-19 when testing? You mean, uh, if you test through the infective phase, this is probably your question, how we can Maybe. prevent this. Yeah, mm -hmm. first of all, uh, these, the, the, the lung function should not be performed in a normal pulmonary function lab where many patients are measured and where many patients would go through the hospital to see or to enter such a uh, pulmonary function lab. What we have now available is we can measure the lung function that is spirometry and diffusion capacity on bedside only for one patient in his bed or in his room. And therefore, there is, first of all, no uh, chance to then infect another person within the room. All the uh, per per person performing 
the lung function uh, test, they are controlled by, by, by all what they have, irrespective of the place they are doing this. But the important use is, do you infect other patients? And if you do this bedside, then the, then the likelihood of infecting somebody is very, very low. In particular, I think the, um, in the, the product of NDD, this is, because this is the only one who allows this, there are filters which more than 95% of the viruses um, re were, were retired. And uh, therefore, we, we believe that the information which we can uh, gather under these conditions are so important that this type of um, lung function measurement should be into, uh, introduced in the appropriate places. Okay. Thank you very much. I hope this answered the participants' question and otherwise please let us know if not. Um, then the next question. Do you recommend the DLCO to be done pre or post bronchodilator administration? So pre or post what? Bronchodilator administration. Sorry, I don't understand. Okay, so maybe the person can specify the question a little bit more. Then the next one. Is the DLCO abnormality specific to COVID-19 or is it also seen in other pneumonias? Um, probably it, is also, it can also be seen in another pneumonia, but the severity of um, the DCO is much more pronounced, but a direct comparison is very difficult to do. Um, because um, also during pneumonia, um, it is not um, common to measure doing this um, uh, process. But what I mean is, um, in contrast to pneumonia in COVID, the, the intravascular changes are so prominent. And this is a unique opportunity to measure the functional consequences of intrapulmonary changes due to all these things I have explained to you. And if we know that these very early starts, then we probably also um, using uh, anticoagulation um, at an earlier time as this is done now. And this is very important because the main, the main damage by the, um, at the consequence of COVID-19 in the lungs is within the vasculature. This information is new, but the consequences are not drawn. But you see, um, the persons are now starting to perform um, imaging as early as possible. And therefore, it may be probably much easier to perform lung function instead of imaging and I'm not quite sure whether an imaging procedure over a certain time will avoid any way to infect others working within the room. We have to think about this, and uh, I hope that uh, valid and good uh, discussion will start um, within the next yeah, period of week or months about this. Okay, thank you very much. Then there is another question. We are currently doing lung function testing six weeks after hospital discharge. Is this the norm? It is the norm. Yeah, I, the wonderful. Do it. Do it. Because then you, then you can predict uh, how severe the post-COVID uh, problems are. If lung function improves, in particular DLCO, then probably the, the, the yeah, uh, it's much better for the patient than if it's not too weak in this. Uh, this is a wonderful thing to have objective data for the patient. And from my perspective, uh, if uh, a patient uh, is re reads 
articles in newspaper about all the 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 the, 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 the security of um, um, COVID-19. These patients must be crazy, uh, and if they have an objective information that there is a change in the in diffusion capacity, for example, but this will decrease then probably they will feel much better because they have the solid data. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, let me see, next question. Um, how Frequently, do you measure DSO in patients with DSO impairment to supervise improvement? How often DSO should be measured? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, post hospital or within the hospital. Okay. Probably so post hospital. <laughs> I believe it would be enough to do this um, every four weeks or so. Okay. During the beginning, during the beginning, and if there is an increase, improvement of DLCO uh, within the first uh, couple of weeks, and then you can make this every uh, three months or so. But um, if the patient has symptoms, then it may be very important for the patient and for you to understand that these respiratory symptoms are related to a process which impair diffusion capacity. This is the basic information. And then you can discuss with the, your patient, okay, in the majority of patients, there is an improvement of DLCO if you perform an appropriate rehabilitation. But in few of them, this may be not, but these with no improvement, they probably have already a diffusion capacity or lung function impairment before the disease. And therefore, it's a pity that we do not have no data on patients um, with COVID, though we, we know millions and millions and millions about their lung function before the disease. But I hope that in the, within the next time, uh, researcher groups will find themselves to ask and to look for lung function data uh, before the COVID-19 um, disease. And then we, this would be a great step in our understanding. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, then we do have the question, which is a little bit more specified now. Um, do you recommend the DLCO to be done pre or post bronchodilator administration? Oh, yeah. um, I believe, uh, yeah, we, we are normally do this um, before bronchodilation, but um, this is not so important. Um, I, I do not uh, believe that there is a real change in diffusion capacity, whether or not a bronchodilation uh, has been performed, except if you perform bronchodilation after bronchodilator. After bron I so thought this is probably my misunderstanding. Uh, the colleague probably mean spirometry before and after bronchodilator. Then you have to do first the diffusion capacity. Sorry about this. Okay, thank you. Then the next one, we do have many questions here. Um, if anyone is exposed to COVID-19, does he ha has to do a PFT exam, or when a patient is COVID positive, can he perform a PFT? Um, sorry, again, I do not get the, the question of this. Okay, so maybe also here the person can specify a little bit better. Um, next question, how does the measurement affect the patient pathway? The patient's pathway? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Again, I do not understand. Okay. What did, what, he says, what, the D, DLCO measurements determines the pathway of a patient? There no, is on, only mentioned measurement, but maybe the person can specify the question a little bit better. Yeah, sorry about yeah. this. <laughs> no problem, no problem. We can. It would be easier way. if we see each other. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank Next you. year. <laughs> um, yes. I think the other questions we will maybe answer each individually because they are very specific. Yes. Uh, I, I, if you have questions, don't hesitate to write me a short email. Uh, it's no problem, and I will try to answer this. Sometimes it is much easier. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I would also say we get back to the people individually who have um, sent questions because there are many, many questions coming in. And then we can also discuss those questions yeah. in detail and I'm answer all, I'm also detail. very much interested in your questions because these questions are so important. Mm -hmm. We talk about this. Yeah. So far, I've never heard so many questions about the the need of measuring a DLCO. We are on the right way. Please answer me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, as you have heard, Professor Magnussen is very open to answer your questions also separately. We will get in touch with each of you to answer those. And apart from that, I would like to thank Mr. Yeah. Yeah. Magnussen very much again for yeah. the presentation yeah. and also to the participants thank you very much for your attention and at the very okay. end at uh, this moment um, watching is for me much easier than speaking <laughs> <laughs> and goodbye goodbye stay healthy bye bye everybody yeah goodbye